the Desert Fathers. But it's not only the Desert Fathers, there's a whole string of people who come after them from Mount Sinai, from Gaza, from Syria, uh, from Asia Minor. Once the empire had, be had been declared Christian, a lot of people said, now we're free. And we're going to try and live a holy life as best we can. And a lot of, they were, uh, rose up a lot of groups in villages and towns all the way over the eastern Mediterranean who wanted to face the issue of how do we live the gospel together. So as I say, some of them went out into the desert, far, in, into the desert, because at least the desert you had the freedom to work out as best you could without any hindrance. Now, the growth of holy men in the early Christian period, after this, uh, uh, after the uh, period of martyrdom had come to an end, is actually quite phenomenal. Uh, as one of you. Uh, uh, Boris it was, who uh, bought me a book recently when he, uh, when he was in Greece. And it's about the monks of Mount Athos and those who came before them. And one of the interesting things about reading that book is, is that if you looked on a map of Eastern Europe, of the Eastern Mediterranean, and put your finger on all the high mountains, all the way around to Egypt and so on, all these mountains had holy men living on top of them. It was as though they went out to pray in the desolate places, to pray for the empire, which was in itself struggling to be Christian, but they, so to speak, upheld the world in prayer. Come on in. There we are. Now, one of the great things about having holy men scattered about uh, the place was that you could go and see them. Uh, and uh, this became quite a thing to do because the holy men, in a sense, exercised a great fascination on the early Christians. And they went and saw these people, they to speak to them, ask their advice, ask their prayers, but essentially, to go and look at a holy man was quite an experience. Now you might think, what do you mean, John? Well, let me describe just one experience that I have had. Is that when I was 20, I was blessed by being able to go to Father Sophroni in the monastery of Tolson Knights. Now here was I, a young, raw, 20-year-old, knew very little about Christianity, to be frank. But uh, I was asked whether I would like to go and see him with a friend, a company of friends. So I said, fine. I met Father Sophroni, and he called me into his study on the, Sunday, on the Sunday afternoon, and he just looked at me. And that was a, a, an indescribable experience, because he said to me, do you know what the purpose of the Christian life is? And I said no, because of course I didn't know. So he said, it is to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts, <coughs> that he may cleanse them and make us like Christ. Fancy that? Fancy doing that? Well, as I sat there before him, I suddenly realised, without any shadow of doubt, that here was a man who knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking from experience and not from theory. He was a man who had become holy. And if you don't believe me, you will find in the, in the near future that the Patriarch of Constantinople will declare him a saint. And it has an ex I, when I looked at him, it's as the strands of hair in the back of my neck stood up. And uh, there was no kind of arguing. There's no kind of arguing when you are faced with holiness. And this is part of the fascination of people trying to find the gospel that they can find it put into practice by a holy man. Now just pause for a minute to think, go, come into the present. If we were, so to speak, back in time in the Eastern Empire and we looked up to the mountains, we could say, 
that mouse skidder up there. And you would know there was a holy man on top. And you could go to various other peaks, no doubt, and down the country, not only peaks but islands. You know there are several holy islands all the way round the coast of Britain. And in a way, in a way here, Derwentwater had its holy island because on it was living the life of holiness by uh, St. Herbert. It will make an extraordinary effect to think as you're going around, travelling around, oh, there's a holy man praying on the top. There's a holy man on that island praying for me. The trans, the, I will put you, the landscape gets transformed. I was once in Ireland, and if you know about uh, anything about Ireland at all, it was absolutely full of monks. And it became quite fascinating, especially out on the Western Isles where there are mountains and islands by the, by the dozen, to know that there's one certain mountain called the Mountain of St. Patrick, Croag Patrick. And as you travelled round, say within a radius of 50 miles all the way round, it had a most compelling effect. You would look up and you would see the mountain Croag Patrick and you would know that there's a holy man up there on top of it. And everywhere you went, everywhere you turned in the road or you're travelling along, you could see Croag Patrick for miles around. And to know that once St. Patrick and those who followed him were praying on top. And it exercises a fascination, almost an eerie fascination. And the world, instead of just being filled with rubbish, we suddenly realised here the world is being transformed by the holy men who live in it and pray for it. <coughs> now then, I, I find that quite astounding. And I often, as I go back Cumbria, I think of some of the ancient monasteries that lie in Cumbria, some of the uh, ancient holy wells, and so on and so on. That the, the, trans, the uh, landscape, so to speak, gets transformed into a spiritual landscape. Now, how does all this work, uh, relate to the icons? Well, it was the people found it wonderful to go up for a weekend to see the holy man and ask his advice. But... Somebody thought, wouldn't it be marvellous if we had a portrait of the holy man which we could hang up in our kitchen? And this is the, it, be, the beginning of icons. The realising that you could paint in such a way that you could portray a holy man. And this is the fascination of icons. If you look at some of these people, if you look at St Anthony, and you know his story, now he spent years praying, but when he was found by the people, he was radiant and shone like the sun. And you could go around all these people, and they said the most amazing holy men. And it's because of the genius of the icon that we can stand and feel that when we look at an icon, we are looking at the per we're in the presence of the person who's portrayed there. And this is very important, of course, for. Uh, uh, icons of our Lord and our Mother of God, but as you see, we have plenty of icons of holy men all the way around us. Now, this they're not just pictures. That's the first thing to get over. That these uh, the icons are rep representing a spiritual presence with whom, or the person with whom you can connect and pray to. It's not until you do this that you enter into, um, I can only call, a spiritual experience of the communion of the saints. Just to give you one example, the father, as you know, the first one I uh, went to and found to be a saint was Father Sophroni. And with him, he had his spiritual father, and his spiritual father was St. Siloan of Athos. Every time I go up to our chapel, I stop before the icon of St. Siloan and I say, Holy St. Siloan, pray for me, a sinner. I go up a bit, few, few steps further and there is Father Sophroni, a picture of Father Sophroni, and I say, Father Sophroni, pray for me, a sinner. I say that in the morning and in the evening. And over time, you become almost eerily aware 
that the icon is representing San Siloan or Father Sophroni, and they are truly there, amenable to our prayers and present in our worship. Just the head in Mount Saint, oh, it's a load of poppycock. Can I just challenge you to try it? Because this is the wonderful thing, this is why it's Orthodox Sunday today. The one, this is something that is uniquely part of Orthodoxy. In particular, that the, uh, 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 when we worship in our liturgy, to whom are we present? We are present to the Lord, to the Mother of God, 